Well, you can open your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings. Proverbs 28, 2 says that when a land transgresses, its rulers are many. And that principle we get to see carried out over and over again in the book of 2 Kings. A rebellious people is given ruler after wicked ruler until finally God fulfills his own word and just removes them entirely from the land. One commentator says about 2 Kings, Bible readers who have braved their way through 1 and 2 Kings are sometimes dazed by the apparent maze of details, especially when the writer takes us through the various kings of Israel and Judah, switching back and forth along the way. We can handle two Jeroboams in one kingdom and a Rehoboam in the other contemporary with one of the Jeroboams. But when there's a Jehoram or Joram in each kingdom at about the same time, not to mention double Ahaziahs, we go into historical overload. Like warm jello, it all seems to melt into hopeless confusion. And maybe you felt like that as you've read through First and Second Kings and you just get lost in the details and just start wondering, when does this end? Well, there's plenty of instruction to take, even if you can't neatly sort through the details. Uh, maybe it'll bring you some comfort to know that even biblical scholars have a hard time sorting through the details especially the timeline that just doesn't seem to add up. Nobody can get it to add up rightly. Nevertheless, there is incredible instruction and encouragement for us to take from the book of Kings. Uh, we noted last week that originally this was one single volume that later got divided into the two that we have with us. And I want to just remind you of the purpose, um, just one way of capturing what the writer in this inspired volume is doing, uh, all of this being given by God. First and second Kings preserve the inspired record of Israel's history from the time of its greatest glory to its eventual demise. And I'll add this week that it does this, First and Second Kings preserve the inspired record of Israel's history from the time of its greatest glory to its eventual demise, documenting God's persistent pursuit of his people through the prophets and their persistent stubborn rebellion. This documents God's persistent pursuit of his people through the prophets and their persistent stubborn rebellion. This inspired history of Israel ends up somewhat becoming a commentary on why at the time that it was written, the people found themselves in the position that they did. Exiled, thrust out of the land finally, and this just documents for the people who would have heard these words originally, why they find themselves in enemy territory, no longer in the land of Israel. It was because of their persistent, stubborn rebellion as God had been persistently pursuing them through his prophets. If you read just consistently through these two books, it could feel like there's an interlude, uh, a diversion from an emphasis on the kings to then an emphasis on the prophets to then back at an emphasis on the kings. Uh, that's not exactly what's going on. The, the kings and the prophets have, are, are both a prominent theme throughout both books. And yet I think what the writer is doing by highlighting both characters and the kings and the prophets 
is he is just showing how God is pursuing Israel or Judah, the divided nation, through his prophets, calling them back to obedience, calling them back to repentance. And when, when all else fails, he finally just removes them from the land. Again, just to remind you that a, a simple outline, sort of five eras to see in Israel's history. If you took these two books together, you would have had the golden era in the first 11 chapters under Solomon's reign. David dies. Solomon comes on the scene, takes over, establishes his kingdom, and the, the temple builds his own house. All of those details being filled out for us in the first 11 chapters. The kingdom is divided because of Solomon's king and uh, Solomon's uh, sin and Rehoboam's folly. So you get the divided kingdom, the second era, while it's at enmity. So Israel, 10 tribes, Judah, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And then chapters 12 through 16 document the kingdom at enmity, that divided kingdom at enmity. And then there's a, a time of peace between those nations. They sort of give up trying to conquer each other for a time. And then 1 Kings 16 all the way through 2 Kings 9 give us the details of that time, the, the divided kingdom at peace. So you have the golden era, the divided kingdom at enmity, the divided kingdom at peace, taking us all the way through 2 Kings chapter 9. And then you get documented the decline and fall of Israel in 2 Kings 10 through 2 Kings chapter 17. There's this spiraling down as Israel never sees a faithful king. Every king walks in the transgressions of its first king, Jeroboam, and there's a consistent downward spiral until finally in chapter 17, they are brought into exile by Assyria. And then the remainder of the book of 2 Kings documents the kingdom after the fall of Israel or Samaria, all focusing on Judah, 2 Kings 18, through its exile in chapter 25. And so that's a simple uh, division of the book and really, if, if we were to just read through those portions, we just get almost a rehearsal of the same story. There's plenty of assassinations. <laughs> Another rebel takes the throne. He doesn't remain long. Someone assassinates him, or he eventually falls off the scene. But if you're talking about Israel, consistent idolatry, consistent rebellion and stubbornness, toward the Lord. And then in Judah, even though they have some flashes of uh, good, some righteous kings come on the scene, nevertheless, they eventually return in short order back to their rebellious, idolatrous ways. And so it's, it's a simple uh, repeating pattern that we see Some major events, just to note, we won't look at all of these. Uh, there's the famous story of the two bears in chapter 2. There's Elisha's death in chapter 13. There's repeated assassinations constantly happening, it seems. Uh, Sennacherib's invasion and defeat. Hezekiah's illness and recovery. Josiah's famous reforms. All of those things documented for us in this book. And we'll note a couple things, but really uh, for our time today, as we sort of talk about 2 Kings and as I take you through this book, one thing that I want to note is the consistent fulfillment of God's promises that happen in this book. Uh, I think one lesson among all the lessons to take away is God's consistent fulfillment of his own promises and even for a, a New Testament audience, just like for the Old Testament audience, 
that lesson would have been abundantly clear and it would have provided abundant hope and encouragement for the original recipients of the letter as well as what it does for us. It teaches us that same lesson as we look at the consistent fulfillment of the letter. You remember uh, what, I, what I've been saying, all roads lead back to Torah. All roads lead back to Torah. The same is true of this book. And we see that at the very opening of the book. So if you're in chapter one, you'll note that we are introduced in the beginning of the chapter to uh, Ahaziah, his ascension to the throne. So Moab, verse 1, revolted after Israel's death, or excuse me, against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go, inquire of Baal Zabub, the god of Ekron, whether I will live from this sickness. But the angel of Yahweh said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal Zabub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says Yahweh, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then Elijah departed. So here's this wicked king of Israel, God's prophet that we were already familiar with from 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah is uh, reintroduced here. He's got another word for this wicked king of Israel. And what, what's happening here at the beginning of uh, 2 Kings, Elijah as the definitive prophet in Israel is being reemphasized. And then in short order, he's going to make a transition off the scene to where his mantle, literal mantle, is passed to another prophet, Elisha. And if you remember from, uh, again, what we mentioned last week, we're covering a lot of history in a few words, ultimately. Uh, just over 400 years of history, all documented for us in some five or 50,000 words, not very many. And so the details that are included in the book exist for a particular purpose. There's something that the author is driving at since he's getting all of this history in the few words that he does. And so when he documents the the rebellion of the king, the challenge from Elijah, uh, the death of those messengers that are sent from the king against Elijah, and then the quick transition from Elijah to a new prophet, Elisha, all of that is for this singular purpose, again, to just note God's pursuit of his people through his prophets and their consistent rebellion against God. Note here in what we just read that they are so bent against God and in in their idolatry that when there is a famous prophet in Israel known for articulating God's thoughts, bringing God's very words, his secret counsel to the people, this king doesn't even seek the counsel of the prophet. He goes to a foreign king outside of the land to know something as mysterious as whether he will recover from the sickness. There's another story later in the book where a pagan king has the sense to seek out the prophet of Israel. Everything's been turned on its head. Well, here you'll see in the the details as uh, we won't recount all of the, the story here, but as Elisha takes the scene, Elisha becomes famous in Israel 
as he takes the literal mantle from Elijah, and as we've been saying, all roads lead back to Torah, that very thing happens here with Elisha. So just direct your attention to chapter 2. Elijah, it's clear, it's been revealed that this is his last day with uh, Israel, in Israel. God's going to take him. The prophets know this. Elisha knows this. And in chapter 2, verse 9, or just back up to uh, uh, verse 8, chapter 2, verse 8, Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them, that is Elijah and Elisha, crossed over on dry ground. So here they are performing a miracle. He strikes the water with his prophetic mantle, and they cross over on dry ground. Verse 9, now it happened when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So here he is asking to... uh, become something of double the prophet that Elijah was. A near impossible task, knowing the kind of prophet that he was. But with that condition, if he sees how he's taken from him, then this request will be granted. Well, he does, and that's the very thing that happened. Uh, Verse 12. And Elisha was seeing this, and he was crying out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. The literal mantle's been passed. And he struck the waters and said, Where is Yahweh, the God of Elijah? Indeed, he himself also struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, and Elijah, Elisha excuse me, crossed over. What does that remind you of, the splitting of the Jordan? This isn't the first time that this has happened. Here they cross one way, and then Elisha crosses by himself back the other way. This is something that's already happened previously, just turn back to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua, being a prophet himself, performed this very same miracle. In Joshua chapter 3, Verse 7, you'll just note the purpose of what God was getting ready to do with Joshua. He needs to establish Joshua's authority and leadership. He says in Joshua 3, 7, Then Yahweh said to Joshua, This day I will begin to magnify you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Moreover, you shall command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come near and hear the words of Yahweh your God. So as they're crossing into the promised land, this is what he does. He has the priests carrying the Ark stand in the Jordan. And just note, jump down to verse 13, and it will be when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. So it happened that when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the ark of the covenant before the people... And when those who carried the ark came into the Jordan, 
and the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of the harvest. The waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap, a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathon, and those which were flowing down toward the Sea of the Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had completed crossing the Jordan. Elisha was a prophet like Joshua. And this is all because God was, if you remember what we read in verse 7, God was establishing his presence with Joshua as he was with Moses. This being a similar miracle as the crossing of the Red Sea. You have a body of water where God has to take his people to cross, and the waters stand up in a heap so that the people cross through on dry ground. That language being repeated, whether you're reading uh, what we read in 2 Kings 2 or here in Joshua 3 or in Exodus chapter 14, it notes in each of those contexts that they crossed on dry ground. So Elisha is a man in the same line of prophets as Moses and as Joshua and as Elijah. Just a few other parallels. If you go back to 2 Kings for a moment. The miracles that the prophet Elisha performs are documented by the writer of Kings in rapid succession. Here you have the crossing of the Jordan being one miracle in chapter 2. You have the uh, purifying of bitter water also in chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 19. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, now the habitat of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad. And the land is unfruitful. And he said, bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And he went out to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, thus says Yahweh, I have purified these waters. There shall be no or there shall not be from their death or barrenness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Does that remind you of anything? The purifying of bitter water should remind us of Exodus 15, when the people came out of Egypt, the first challenge after they sing this song that they encounter is bitter water. Exodus 15, uh, 20 through, 22 through 27, Moses throws in uh, a, a tree <laughs> into the water, and the waters became sweet in that, in that section of Scripture. So again, this road leading back to the Torah, Elisha is like Moses and him purifying bitter water. And then the third miracle in 2 Kings 2 is that he curses a group of irreverent people, which results in immediate judgment by God. This is the famous story of the two bears. Children, pay attention. 2 Kings 2, 23. Then Elisha went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, young boys came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Don't make fun of older, bald men, is what this means. Leviticus 19.32 talks about honoring the aged. That was in the law, Leviticus 19.32. So what happens as a result of these young men mocking the prophet? Verse 24, he looked and behold, 
or he looked behind him and saw them, and he cursed them in the name of Yahweh. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. And he went up from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Samaria. This was not too harsh a judgment. They are ir- irreverent young men not fearing the Lord as the law required. And so as the prophet curses them, immediate judgment comes from God. Something similar happened in Numbers 16. You'll remember what Korah's rebellion. Irreverent group of men taking their stand against God's prophet. And Moses curses them and immediately the earth opens up and devours the irreverent men. And we won't look at all the rest of these, but the, just some other parallels between Elisha and the other prophets. He rescues a widow and her son through uh, increasing oil. So the oil doesn't run out. That happens with Elijah as well as Elisha. So that's 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, as well as 1 Kings 17. He resurrects a woman's son like Elijah, 2 Kings 4 and 1 Kings 17. And he strikes a rebellious Jew with leprosy. That also happened uh, with Moses. Uh, If you're thinking Elisha, it was his servant. And then with Moses, it was Miriam. All of those being parallels, I think, to really establish Elisha as a true prophet in the same vein as Moses and Joshua, Elisha. And all of these are just accounted um, in rapid succession. And so the writer spends a lot of ink on the prophet Elisha to demonstrate over and over that he is a genuine prophet. He is calling God's people to obedience and ultimately being rejected. It's part of the reason his travels are also documented. As he travels throughout the territory of Israel, every city is aware of God's prophet, is hearing God's message from this prophet, and is failing to heed his message. The nation does not reform even though Elisha has been traversing the land of Israel. Before we, we turn a corner and just fixate on the, the various fulfillments that happen in the book, just note the number of kings that this rebellious land sees. Let me just read the list of kings. In Israel, you have Jehoram, Jehoahaz. You have Amaziah, Jeroboam, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah, Hoshea, all of those being kings of Israel. And then in Judah... You have Jehoram, Ahaziah. You also have uh, Joash or Jehoahash in Judah as well. You have Uzziah or, as he's known, Azariah. Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Eliakim, Jehoachin, and Zedekiah. When a land transgresses, it has many rulers. The theme of fulfillment is prominent in the book. Time and time again, you have, as God's prophets are going to God's people, you have their words being fulfilled in the very span of the book. 
Sometimes it's immediate. Other times it takes a little bit longer, but eventually the word is fulfilled. And that becomes, ironically, the encouragement as you see curses fulfilled, the ultimate ones of those being the exiles in Israel and Judah. We'll look at that. But you have the curses being fulfilled, which ironically would have become the basis for the encouragement that God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his promises. So all of his beneficial promises, God is still faithful to. And all that it requires is an obedient people, a faithful people who will believe God's promises, and they too will see the fulfillment of God's goodwill toward them. That was the hope of Israel then. That's our encouragement and hope today. So let's just look at this theme of fulfillment. We, we noted uh, or just mentioned one of them already. Go back to the beginning of the book. You have Ahaziah's death, Ahaziah's death in the first chapter of the book. He wants to know from a pagan God if he's going to survive. Well, God has something to say to him. And it's in verse 4. Thus says Yahweh, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Clearly, he does not like this word that comes to him. He sends messengers to go kill Elijah, a commander, and the 50. And Elijah calls down fire from God, and it consumes the, the adversaries. This happens twice. But eventually, this same word comes to Ahaziah, and it gets fulfilled in verse 17. So Ahaziah died according to the word of Yahweh, which Elijah had spoken. And because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. So this was according to the word of Yahweh. It was fulfilled just as he had spoken. Elijah's curses on the the king's messengers in verses 10 and 12 come about. God fulfills those things. Just look at those briefly. Elijah answers these messengers and spoke to the commander of 50. If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. This happens again, verse 12. Elijah answered and spoke to them, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. God, there he is again, fulfilling his word through his prophet. So the curses against the king's messenger fulfilled both times. We looked at Another one of these, a third fulfillment. Elisha receives a double portion of Elijah's spirit in chapter 2, verse 10. He saw what he was supposed to see, and he received what he requested to receive. So he does eventually become double the prophet that Elijah was. What about this fulfillment? The economic reversal in Israel in chapter 7. This is no small feat. Turn to chapter 7. Aram, for many years, has been at war with Israel. They make an attack again against Samaria. And because of... uh, Aram's siege, verse 25 says, there's a great famine in Samaria, a great famine. And behold, they besieged it until a donkey's head, something not delicious, not desirable, was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth of a cab of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. 
things that they would never think about eating or using in times of economic prosperity are now very expensive. Reminds you of the price of eggs in our day, right? These things that would have been worthless or not very valued become incredibly expensive because of the famine in their day. This gets so bad that verse 26 says, just note what's happening. This woman is crying out as the king of Israel is passing on the wall. She, needs, she wants a savior. Save me, O Lord, my Lord, O king. He responds, if Yahweh does not save you, from where shall I save you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king said to her, what is the matter with you? And she said, this woman said to me, give, me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So they make this deal as they're starving in the midst of the famine to eat each other's children. Verse 29, so we boiled my son and ate him, and I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. She, this lady wants justice. <laughs> Make her uphold her end of the bargain. Make her boil her son so we can eat him now. Don't all roads lead back to Torah? Leviticus 26, 29 said that if they did not obey, that this would happen. Listen to Moses. Verse 27, if in spite of this you do not obey me, God says, but walk in hostility against me, then I will walk in wrathful hostility against you, and I, even I, will discipline you seven times for your sins. Further, you will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you will eat. This was a judgment from God on a rebellious people. This is a fulfillment of that very prophecy from Moses. It's happening. Due to a siege, there's a famine, and now they're so desperate that they're eating one another. They've resorted to cannibalism. At this time, Elijah, Elisha makes another prophecy. When all hope has been lost of any good coming economically in the midst of this famine, he says, verse 1 in chapter 7, listen to the word of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, about this time tomorrow, a sea of fine flour will be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. At a time when a donkey's head is being sold for 80 shekels and dove dung for five shekels, now fine flour and barley, plenty of it, get sold for a single shekel. And this is in the gate of Samaria. Notice the royal officer's unbelief in verse 2. The royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning answered the man of God and said, Behold, if Yahweh should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Then he said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. You're going to see the reversal of the economy in a moment, and you will not benefit. Something this impossible will happen. And just note the specificity. About this time tomorrow, you get the time and the day. How much does that differ from the so-called prophecy in our day? Right? The super general, random predictions. This is specific because it's coming from the God who knows and controls the future. This is uh, 
exactly what happens. Jump down. Uh, Well, you can just see the cause, verse 6. The Lord caused the camp of the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and a sound of horses, even the sound of a great military force, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Therefore they arose and fled in the twilight and forsook their tents and their horses and their donkeys, even the camp, just as it was, and fled for their life. For no apparent reason but to fulfill God's word, they believe a lie. They hear a delusion. And instead of acting like a group of mighty men, they run. And all of this is discovered by a group of outcasts, lepers, who are on the outskirts of the camp. They can't even be in the city. They discover this. They bring word back to Samaria that this has happened. And then the people, upon realizing that this is the case, that this is indeed good news, go and just collect everything that's been left behind. And look at verse 15. Then they went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment, which the Arameans had thrown away in their haste. Then the messengers returned and told the king, so the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans. Then a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of Yahweh. According to the word of Yahweh. Again. So this economic reversal comes true. It happens. But the other part of that, that the royal officer wouldn't see it, also comes to pass. Verse 17, Now the king appointed the royal officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate, but the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died just as the man of God had spoken, who spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two seahs of barley for a shekel and a seah of fine flour for a shekel will be sold tomorrow about this time at the gate of Samaria. And the royal officer had answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if Yahweh should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, Behold, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him or trampled on him at the gate, and he died. More fulfillment. What about the king of Aram's uh, appointment, Hazael? This is in chapter 8. Ben-Hadad is the king at the time, but he's sick. He, unlike Israel's own king, goes and inquires of Israel's prophet. And when he sends the commander of his army at the time, Hazael, in verse 8 of chapter 8, he says, take a present in your hand and go to meet the man of God and inquire of Yahweh by saying, will I be restored to life from this sickness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present in his hand, even every kind of good thing of Damascus, 40 camels loads, and he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I be restored to life from this sickness? Then Elisha said to him, Go and say to him, You will surely be restored to life. But Yahweh has shown me that he will certainly die. And he fixed his gaze steadily on him until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Then Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? Then he said, Because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. Their fortifications you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword, and their infants you will dash in pieces, and their pregnant women you will rip up. Then Hazael said, But what is your servant, who is but a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, 
Yahweh has shown me that you will be king over Aram. So he went from Elisha and said to his master, and he said to him, what did Elisha say to you? And he said, he said to me that you will surely be restored to life. Well, it's true enough. But then verse 15, it happened on the following day. He took the cover and dipped it in water and spread it on his face. So he died and Hazael became king in his place. More fulfillment. Through God's prophets, God's words are fulfilled. You can add to this the death of Jehoram, Ahab's descendant, the death of Jezebel, the destruction of Ahab's house by Jehu in chapter 10. This was all predicted by Elijah in 1 Kings 21 that Ahab's descendants would be destroyed, how Jezebel would die, where their deaths would even take place. All of those things were predicted. Israel's threefold recoveries of its cities, Israel's exile, Josiah's reforms, and then Judah's and Israel's exiles. All of these things were predicted beforehand by God's prophets. God's words are fulfilled perfectly that he predicted through God's prophets. These ultimate judgments that get fulfilled by God are, in fact, Israel's own exiles. This happens or is recorded in two chapters for us, 2 Kings 17 and 2 Kings 25. So just turn to 2 Kings 17. We'll just briefly look at these ultimate curses as they are thrust out of the land. In the ninth year, verse 6, of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and took Israel away into exile to Assyria and settled them in Halah and Habor on the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Now this happened because the sons of Israel had sinned against Yahweh their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the nations whom Yahweh had dispossessed from before the sons of Israel and in the statutes of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the sons of Israel did things secretly which were not right against Yahweh their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their cities from watchtower to fortified city, and they set for themselves sacred pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. So they're exiled because of their persistent disobedience. And this was all predicted long beforehand by Moses. This was all predicted by Moses. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are all important chapters in your Old Testament. Much of what happens that's discussed by the major and minor prophets as they prophesy against Israel in the timing that occurs in First and Second Kings, all of those prophets, they constantly quote, Moses from the Torah and from those two chapters in particular of Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. So let's just look back for a moment at the very predictions that we find fulfilled in the exile of Israel. Go back to Leviticus 26 as you hold your place here in 2 Kings. Leviticus 26 verse 33 Back up to verse 30 in Leviticus 26, where God says, I will then destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and give your corpses to lie on the corpses of your idols 
for my soul shall loathe you. And I will give your cities over as a waste and will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not smell your soothing aromas. And I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who inhabit it will themselves feel desolate because of it. You, however, will scatter among the nations, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you and your land will become desolate and your cities become waste. Then the land will make up for its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation and you will be in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and make up for its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest, which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living in it. And then just jump over to Deuteronomy 28. We'll see the same thing repeated. Look at verse 64, Deuteronomy 28. Moreover, Yahweh will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you and your fathers have not known. Moreover, among those nations you shall find no relief, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there Yahweh will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and despair of soul. So your life shall hang in doubt before you, and you will be in dread night and day, and you shall not have any faith in your life. They will do this from other nations. This is what's happening in 2 Kings 17 as they are thrust out of the land. Just note the, the author's own commentary on why these things are happening. Go back to 2 Kings 17, as he just at length details why this is happening. Verse 14, however, they did not listen, but stiffened their neck like their fathers who did not believe in Yahweh their God. They also rejected his statutes and his covenant, which he cut with their fathers and his warnings with which he warned them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the nations which surrounded them concerning which Yahweh had commanded them not to do like them. And they forsook all the commandments of Yahweh their God and made for themselves molten images, even two calves and made an Asherah and worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal." Then they made their sons and daughters pass through the fire and practiced divinations and omens and sold them to do what is evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger. So Yahweh was very angry with Israel and caused them to depart from his presence. None was left except the tribe of Judah alone. Also, Judah did not keep the commandments of Yahweh their God, but walked in the statutes which Israel had made. So Yahweh rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and gave them into the hand of plunderers until he had cast them from his presence. And the author notes, this is all done up until this day. This was done until this day, verse 23. In 25, chapter 25, it just notes just quickly. Nebuchadnezzar, now years later, at about 586 B.C., he has taken these exiles captive. Verse 8, now on the seventh day of the fifth month, month, which was the 19th year of the king of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of Yahweh, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem, even every great house, he burned with fire. 
So all the military force of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard tore down the walls around Jerusalem. Then the rest of the people who were left in the city and the defectors who have defected to the king of Babylon and the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, took away into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to the vine dressers and the plowmen. And then it goes on and talks about what, what he left, what they took away. Verse 16 says that all the bronze vessels were beyond weight. It's a way of just saying that the glory, the weight, everything that was glorious in Israel is now gone. The glory has departed. And yet all of this was predicted if they did not keep God's commandments. What do we take away from seeing these fulfillments after fulfillment after fulfillment? Pretty depressing fulfillments. Well, you can take away the preeminent lesson that God is faithful to his own promises. God is faithful to his own promises. Whether it's a faithfulness to curse or a faithfulness to bless, God will be faithful. The story, as we noted last week, ends on a high note that even the ruler brought into exile is while he's in exile, raised to prominence above every other ruler in Babylon. That's an intentional way of the writer just demonstrating that God is still caring for his people. And so the God who brought about all of the fulfillment of his word up to that day, fulfillment on his curses, all of the better promises, the better words from God that are still outstanding, he will also fulfill. God will be faithful to his promises. That's good news. As you read through your Bible, all of the promises yet to be fulfilled, we take communion here every Sunday because of a promise or until a promise that is yet fulfilled comes about until he comes again. A reminder every week here that God is not done completing his promises. The God who promised will fulfill these things. This would have been a comfort for Israel, knowing that the land promises that God made, that he would bring his people back into the land, give them an inheritance, in Israel, even though those things may not seem like they would happen, they were not true in their day after the exile. The promises are still outstanding, and every true prophet that came along, that prophesied that God would care for his people, that he would fulfill his promises to David, that he would fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God is faithful. And that is good news for us because we worship the same God. The God of Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joshua, the God of Elijah, the God of Elisha, the God of Jeremiah. We worship that same God and his promises are still outstanding. Namely, we wait for a kingdom to come, a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a kingdom from which we will not be removed, a kingdom that possesses a better king ruling that kingdom, a better savior than the kings who were unable to save in Israel's day. We worship that same savior. We wait for that same king. We wait for that same kingdom, and that kingdom is coming. Let me just end with, with one passage and direct your attention to the New Testament. Go to Matthew chapter 5. It's no accident that Jesus, following 
the final Old Testament prophet's ministry in John the Baptist, preaches this famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And acting as something of a hinge between the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament times, he, no- he notes the blessings that are tied to Old Testament realities, Old Testament characteristics that would characterize kingdom citizens. Any faithful Jew, Old Testament, would have been characterized by these things, but Jesus mentions that this blessing is theirs looking to the future. Just note the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, verse 2. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the lowly, for they shall inherit the earth or the land. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I want to encourage us as we think about God's faithfulness to fulfill his own word, if you believe God, if you, Christian, believe that he is faithful, then live like God fulfills his promises. Believe God, submit yourself to God, and if you are one who believes him and the evidence shows in a faithful life, then you can bank on God's outstanding promises, that his promises to you will be fulfilled, and you are a citizen of a kingdom that's coming. Let me pray. God, thank you for your own testimony about your own faithfulness, that you love to be glorified in the fulfillment of your own word. You love to promise the impossible, even promises that require an impossible resurrection to be fulfilled. And in that way, you ensure that we can only know you by faith. We can only be saved by faith, by banking our eternal good on your character, on your own faithfulness. God, if there's anyone here who does not believe you, who does not believe your promises in the gospel, that Christ died, rose again, he is coming again. God, I pray that you would give them faith, a believing heart to entrust themselves to you, and that all of us who have entrusted ourselves to you, that you would increase our faith, that we might walk in a way that is worthy of the calling to which we've been called, that we would walk as all faithful saints throughout history have by faith, looking to your sure promises as we entrust ourselves to you moment by moment to fulfill your word to us. God, we pray that you would do just that, that you would send Christ, that he would come quickly, and that until then, God, that we would live a life of consistent faithfulness as we look to you. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.